Hello, everyone. Welcome again to our Wednesday anti-racism conversation series, PTS Response. Can you believe we're already in the second half of August, heading to the start of a new academic year? And as we are headed into the home stretch of our series with just three more conversations to go, including today's, we're going to be finishing strong. We hope you join us for the remaining conversations as well as today. Last week, we spent time with our professor of urban ministry and director of Metro Urban Institute, Drew Smith. I can't think of anyone in our PTS community who is a more wise and informed interlocutor on issues of community organizing and the ongoing work of civil rights. We spent time talking about the challenges of being an ally, particularly the hard work of sustaining alliances and moving past the solidarity theater, as he called it, of standing with in the heat of the moment and digging into the long-term internal and external shifts required of long-term cultural and social change. We talked about the power of the tool of disruption for those on the margins who don't have access to the resources and power of institutions and institutional membership. And for those of us who are white and claim a commitment to racial justice, we were challenged once again by the words of the Reverend Dr. King from 57 years ago as he named the problems with liberal self-confidence and the gradualist instinct that stalls the work of justice in his letter from a Birmingham jail. And yet we know that the work of justice requires a variety of tools and approaches, an ecosystem, if you will, of different people using different levers to effectively cultivate social change in their unique contexts. In short, it takes a village. And the vision for justice remains a shared commitment, but the approaches need to differ based on where people are in their journey of awakening to the need for change. Which brings us to our conversation today. I'm delighted that we have Angela Hancock with us today. She serves as our Associate Professor of Homiletics and Worship. She's an ordained PCUSA Minister of Word and Sacrament, and as a scholar, she's received numerous awards for her preaching. She's the author of Karl Barth's Emergency Homiletic 1932-33, to which explores Barth's contribution to the ethics of deliberation in Christian communities and the function of the preaching office to bear witness to the good news. In particular, she explores the work of deliberation in faith communities and the relationship between political and theological rhetoric and how these can contribute to or help heal polarized contexts. Welcome, Angela. It's good to have you today. Thank you. So, excellent. Our, our topic today is about bearing faithful witness in polarized communities. And that undoubtedly is going to speak to the hearts and commitments of so many of our participants today, whether we're talking about their families or their church communities or their neighborhoods and social groups. Um, it's gospel stuff, it's public stuff, it's political stuff, but it's also deeply personal. So let's start off today by exploring how you came to be committed to this work and how you came face to face with these challenges. Yeah, I think um, where it started for me is in, in my family of origin and my extended family. And um, my husband and I are the only progressives in a, in a sea of very passionate um, conservative and libertarian um, politically oriented um, family members. And I think um, it's the experience of trying and failing so many times to be able to have fruitful conversations across those differences, which, you know, one of the things that we do all share in this, in our family is a commitment to Jesus Christ. We're all Christians. We all read the same Bible. We all sing the same hymns. We all, uh, go to church and engage in the same practices, but we are unable to find that as our central identity in, in conversation about social and political issues and certainly about something like systemic racism. And so I think, um, you know, that remains a deeply painful reality for me. I think Polarization is not just a statistic, and certainly looking at polarization in the church is not just a statistic for me, but it's an ongoing kind of wound, I think, that, um, that draws me to keep 
investigating and trying to figure out um, what a way forward might be. Um, and at the same time, my research, as you mentioned, has been focused um, at least in part on another time in history where you had a, a democracy in some peril, you had deeply polarized um, a political scene, and you had a Christian church that for the most part, um, in spite of you know, a degree of misgiving about some things, supported a, a racist nationalist political leader because they thought that this was what God's plan was. They thought this is what would save Christianity. And so, um, yeah, the, these, these things have come together for me in, in thinking about what it means to engage in anti-racist witness in relation to those kind of polarizing realities, political realities. Um, yeah. It seems to me then um, you're describing yourself as, as kind of standing in a liminal space in between two deeply held commitments. One is to this understanding of beloved community, of the liberating witness of, of the gospel, and the other hand, the deep love you have for your family. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of in between those two things, and I'm guessing that that's a space a lot of folks can relate to, um, especially as they find themselves perhaps leading communities and holding very different commitments and witness to the gospel themselves than their, the folks in their congregations or yeah. families might be, yeah. might be accepting. So um, in our prep conversation, we're talking about, about polarization. Um, you talked about how we are all malformed by it, which is, I think, another way in which you're, the in-between place you're standing is, is super interesting. Um, why don't you spend a little bit of time talking about some of the concerns you have about, let's say, well-intentioned approaches to anti-racism um, that many people engage in, but that you understand as contributing more significantly to the perpetuation of the division rather than healing it? Yeah, or at least um, that in some contexts, the some of the rhetoric that comes out of schools of you know, anti-racist or anti-bias training have themselves been politicized. Mm -hmm. So that if I am in a, in a church where it is, there is a diversity of political views, and I might actually be, I'm gonna share a slide or two um, okay. just to, to get this landscape before us. Let me see if I can work this magic. And as you're working that magic, just remind our participants that the Q&A and chat pods are there for comments and questions. I'll be checking them regularly as the conversation goes on. Okay, can everybody see that? We're good. Mm -hmm. Good. So um, if we think about the dynamics of polarization in the United States, um, polarization refers to this uh, totalizing of political identity such that it becomes uh, that the, the thing that political scientists measure is your feelings of antipathy toward people who are associated with the opposing political party or political orientation ideology. And you can see here um, in this slide the way that these numbers have gone up um, in, in recent years, and this only takes us to 2014, things have actually gotten, have deteriorated further since then, um, that the antipathy that we feel toward people who hold opposing views is in some many cases stronger than the excitement that we have about our own, uh, the, the party that we associate with. So this is one number that political scientists look at. These identities um, are reinforced in multiple ways. Um, and one way they're reinforced is by where it is that we get our, our information about everything, not just political things. And so um, you may already be familiar with these statistics that people who 
who strongly identify as um, conservative or Republican or even leaning in that direction are getting their news and information about the world from a very different source than people who understand themselves to be progressive or, or, or liberal or democratic. So we are inhabiting very different universes. <laughs> narrative <laughs> universes. Very different narrative yeah. universes, ways yeah. of seeing the world. And it's not that those things disappear when mm -hmm. people come to church. Right. Right. So um, this, this is reinforced right by the choices of who we associate with, the phenomenon of, you know, what are sometimes called enclaves or echo chambers that, that um, people increasingly choosing to live with people who see things the way that they do, to have friends who see things the way that they do. Mm -hmm. But these are things that make it harder and harder for us to have those kind of conversations about political and social issues, about something like systemic racism, um, because of the ways we've been insulated from each other. Um, right. Let me take us even a little further here. So now we may have, um, and, and some of the people listening may be leaders in churches where people do all have the same basic political orientation. The, the mm -hmm. church community identifies itself with a particular political stream or stance. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, there are, you can think probably right away of some churches and some traditions where mm -hmm. that, is, that is largely the case. What I'm most interested in uh, trying to think through is what about this other situation, a congregation where you have a diversity of political views, but where none of these kinds of issues are discussed openly mm -hmm. out of fear that this will result in, you know, kind of worst case scenario in the fracturing of the community, right? Mm -hmm. And there's good reasons for people to fear that. Um, you know, when I talk with people in congregations about why is it so hard to talk about some of these things? Right. And what are your fears when you imagine sitting down with someone who, who doesn't have your same sort of political orientation and opening up some of these things in the church? The fear that's named often has to do with that will, that will mean the end of this church if we start opening up that wound and, and getting in there. So in an avoidant congregation, there are powerful reasons, both for people who are in that congregation, but also people who are leaders in that congregation, just not to, not to do it, not just not to have the conversation that I think we need to have. And, and I believe that, you know, white Christians need to do this work, that it is our responsibility to do this work. But how can we best do this work in the situation where people are so afraid of even talking about something that has become affected by these dynamics of polarization? Um, so that's, that's, the, that's what I've been wrestling with. Um, I think this is an interesting statistic to consider as well. Um, you know, where do we see resistance to having these conversations in a more general sense, but certainly including things like systemic racism, um, where you see that resistance is in um, white Protestant and white Catholic churches they should keep out of political matters. This is, not, this is not what church is about. Places where you see openness to this, willingness to engage, tend to be more homogenous in relation to social and political issues. I'm looking at historically black churches, I'm looking at evangelical churches, right, which understand engagement with politics to be part of who they are, and everyone in the community, um, not that there isn't diversity of views within or commitment and vision. So this is why I think it's important for, um, for white Christians 
to be aware of, of these dynamics. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to skip through um, just briefly to say, again, it's, it's white Protestant situation that where we are right now, who are, whatever reluctance they might express, there's still a willingness to support um, a president who engages in, in not just racist rhetoric, but racist policies. So um, I think this is the landscape we need to attend to, right? If we're gonna, if we're going to, um, if we're going to be effective about this. Yeah. So, and this is so interesting too. Um, I'm, I'm thinking back to the one of the slides where it shows that um, politically polarized communities get their news media and storytelling from very different sources. So there's a kind of unified story within those communities. And I'm thinking about the sharing of a common story that happens in a church community and how that can be leveraged. So, so, so what, what is a church leader to do um, to lean fearlessly, or at least with appropriate trepidation into these um, avoidant congregations? It's a whole lot easier to preach to the choir when you've got a, a, a congregation that is all on the same page politically, theologically, and otherwise. But right, and I think you know it, that some of in, in, it's not to say that uh, you know in those congregations that there still isn't anti-racist work to be done, right? It's that it may be that the, some of the kind of shock therapy approaches may work best in, in some of those kind of contexts. You know, I was thinking about this in relation to, um, you know, there's some research about um, the effectiveness of anti-racist and anti-bias training, noticing that there is some evidence that this training itself can have the opposite of its intended effect. It can actually strengthen, in some cases, the, the, the sort of um, racist attitudes of participants um, in ways that certainly these are, this is not intended. And I think, you know, of course, there's a diversity of approaches now, and there will continue to be even within um, these kind of uh, schools of thought. But I think about language that, um, that has been helpful to many of us in thinking about this and the way in which some of that rhetoric has itself now been politicized. I mean, I did a little digging around just to see um, on Fox News um, site, if you do a search, you know, there are 314 articles about white fragility. And you know this. This is to say, uh, these are these are overwhelmingly negative presentations, right? Of of what this language is about. Um, Anti-racism training, seven hundred. White privilege, six thousand six hundred and seventy. Whiteness, two thousand four hundred and eighty. So when I notice something like that, and I notice that statistic about where people who lean or identify conservative or Republican get their information, that makes me think about what words, what language can I borrow to best invite a constructive conversation about this? Um, and that I have to be creative in that situation if I'm not going to be just priming and activating people's political identities in such a way that we we we, are, we become immediately at an impasse. Um, so it strikes me that what you're referring to, it's this tension that particularly um, Protestant pastors of congregations have. The primary means you have for reaching into the hearts and minds of your people is the rhetorical word. Mm -hmm. and yeah. And the, um, the association of particular words, phrases, language with politically charged and divisive ideas leads people to have a kind of precognitive reaction to some of that language that circuits the capacity for any thought, theory, or 
curiosity, um, non-anxious leaning into stuff. So one of our, our panelists has asked, isn't leaning primarily towards shared political beliefs the same as leaning towards shared religious beliefs? What would you say to that? Yeah, I mean, if you look at those numbers, right, for many, the Christian piece of this is a part of that political identity. Uh, if I mean on the right, it, this you know, I mean I, I got this I got an email forward from a family member um, in the last week or so that is um, that's naming explicitly. I mean at the end of it it says. Um, I believe Trump is our miracle. No one is saying Trump is perfect. No one is saying Trump is a perfect conservative, but he's a patriot. He's a warrior. He's a capitalist. He's the right man at the right time. Yes, he's a bit rude and crude and offensive, but that may make him the perfect warrior to save America, American exceptionalism, capitalism, and Judeo-Christian values. The choice should be easy for Christians. It's Trump or it's the end of the American dream. And you can see these things are just merged together, right? And so piecing some of this apart involves <laughs> even thinking through what, you know, how nationalism plays into this white nationalism, how this, under, this thing, the American dream, bringing that into conversation with what the gospel is. Um, so these things are conflated, right? And I think, you know, I mean, I identify with the progressive, I mean, I'm a political junkie, I'm, I'm on board. And I, of course, believe that the gospel, that this is, this is in important ways, a more faithful response to the gospel, right? Or I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't vote in that way, right? So I mean, yeah, so I think it's it's all right. So, but I mean, somewhere at the heart of this, there there's a there's a really complex, uh, layered and 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 freighted conversation. Yeah. And how do we even begin to have that? So uh, how do we? <laughs> okay. I this, you know? Yeah. And, and I I think you know, I think when you first asked me, you know, can you give a list of things? And I was so resistant to that, right? Because I do think it's, it's, a, time, it's a messy thing. It, it requires improvisation and creativity, et cetera. But I did, I did try. I, I do have some things I think are, um, I think are helpful. Um, I think part of um, impor important piece of this work is getting to the place where you can even find out in an avoidant congregation, what mm -hmm. do people here actually think? Yeah. You know, because you might be surprised. I mean, the mix might not be what it seems to be because people are so careful. Um, and so how is it that you can build the kind of relationships of trust where you can find out some more about where people are? Um, you can also, I think, investigate a bit with the, the artifacts that are available to you, what is the sort of history of conversation in this place about things like racism? I mean, how have they navigated other controversial kinds of things in the past, if mm -hmm. at all? So mm -hmm. trying to learn more about who the people are that you're serving, um, especially which can be really challenging, right, when they aren't going to want to necessarily identify what their political allegiance is. Um, and some of this you can signal, right, by the way in which you are open about your political allegiance in such a way, right, that it makes it clear that you, you want to talk. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's, that can be a challenge. You know, it occurs to me, um, as we're talking about this, so the, the primary toolkit of the preacher is, is rhetorical, and in many ways, higher level thinking and speaking about um, the, the theological warehouse of which they are a steward. But so much of what you're talking about begins with a kind of deeply felt emotional reactivity. That yeah. 
triggered. And like we said before, short circuits the possibility of rational conversation. By beginning with building these trust relationships with people, you're starting at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And the yeah. like that is the most basic thing to build these trust relationships because it occurs to me that so much of this defensiveness people are coming up with as they um, hunker down into their trenches is based in fear and lack of trust. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. beginning with leaning into and doing the hard work of building trust, being curious, listening to people, that does feel like the right place to start. Yeah, even though it cannot be the ending. Oh, right. It can't end there. But, but right. right. And I think about, um, you, you may know the, um, the, the, there's a famous TED Talk by Megan Phelps Roper, um, mm -hmm. who's someone who left the Westboro she was raised in the Westboro Baptist Church, right? But yeah. she and she came out of that, that you know, sort of hate-filled, um, melded with Christianity situation. Um, and and if you haven't seen it, I mean, it's well worth seeing. I mean, her story of leaving that is about some people, you know, starting on Twitter, yep, who stayed in the conversation with her, who would not be dissuaded by her own aggressiveness and right who stayed in there steadily who listened who tried to understand and who were also open about the re not assuming that the reasons why they had the convictions they did were obvious to her um mm -hmm. and so yeah i think staying in there i think if you're gonna have this conversation and you and you and you know you've you've done enough to know that you've got a people with a mixture of political allegiances and some who are strongly identified um, with, say, um, the, uh, uh, the political right, that you don't frame anti-racist activities or conversations or sermons in ways that prime political identity. And political scientists use that language of priming um, mm -hmm. to describe using kind of uh, particular jargon, particular kind of buzzwords and terms that activate a political identity. Um, so, so not using politically coded language to do that. I mean, obviously you have to know what that coded language is, which is why spending some time, you know, on conservative sites, spending some time, especially on conservative Christian mobilization kind of sites where you can see how this is being framed and the language that's being used. Um, Black Lives Matter right now is a topic on those sites um, and you will see there that Black Lives Matter is being framed for Christians there as something that is Marxist, that is anti-Christian, that its goal is to weaken and, and even eliminate the Christian church. And so it's, wow. you know, yeah. this is how this is being framed, right? And mm -hmm. so my understanding that is going to be important if we're going to have a conversation about it. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, figuring out what that jargon is, spending enough time there to know that, and being creative. I mean, I like that language that um, I think it's Teresa Fry Brown, a homiletics um, professor, yeah. uses the language of portability to describe, you know, preachers have to have this in their toolbox for all kinds of reasons, right? Mm -hmm. We have to be able to borrow other language to say things depending on the context that's part of what our what our calling is um and so sure. this i think requires that i'm remembering um when walter Brueggemann was writing about this he talked about the language behind the wall and at the wall the, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. multilinguality that you're talking about where you've got you know the insider language that you use in a more homogenous community but you need to be able to speak at that wall at the divide where there are other people with other commitments and other languages right because that's the only way negotiations can happen and right and it's not that the other the work isn't important in the homogenous right right this is all good it's if you're trying to get right at where that space is in between. And I mean, this maybe sounds like a very pes pessimistic conversation and, and I hope it doesn't because I do feel really hopeful about this. Yeah. Um, because I, I, I mean, and there's lots of people who are on sort of the edge of, of evangelicalism, 
you know, who, who can give testimony to their own journeys. And there's some really mm -hmm. good resources, people writing from that perspective, which I think are actually great places, even if you can get people to read something, might be a great place to start, you know, because it's somebody testifying to movement that will, that will feel more familiar um, in some ways. So I think, um, you know, we've mentioned this before, but I think ways that you can get at this and begin to have conversations about this that, that don't start with just argument, that don't mm -hmm. start with just a rational presentation of data or, uh, or something, but things that start with story, using film, right? creating collaborative art. I mean, I think about, we've had some church planters here who have, you know, had, where people in the community have, have gone um, to create a psalm of lament, but they've done that by going to another community with different concerns from their own and having those conversations and then writing a lament together. I mean, I can imagine that working really well, um, having people go and talk to a community of color and just be curious about what their prayers might sound like at such a time as this, and then creating something out of that. I mean, I think ways that you don't just approach this, um, that, that in some ways mirror, you know, yeah. our, political, our political speech. Um, so we've yeah. got relationship building with trust and curiosity. We've got deep attention to language and um, the ability to become multilingual to help pivoting and nimbleness in using the right language to, to be with people at a certain time. And now you're talking about, about practices that involve art and imagination. Um, none of this involves rhetorical flourish or, or dog whistling. Um, it's about building different ways of relating with each other, it sounds like. Yeah. And not giving up, I mean. And not giving up. Mm -hmm. And not giving up, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, and, and one way you do that is by modeling yourself. You're a co-learner. Yes. You're, right? Um, you know, and I, I, I there's, a, there's a book, I think it's Catherine Cavaney. Um, it's called Prophecy Without Contempt. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think it's, it can be hard, right? Because I, I think, you can feel just really frustrated um, when people don't get it, you know? <laughs> um, and, and what would it mean, you know, I think about how prophets function uh, in scripture, right? I mean, there's some of the time, you know, when they're throwing the book at people, that's true. But a lot of the time, they're, they're dreaming dreams with people. They're, mm -hmm. they're weeping with yeah. and for people. You know, they have to be against the people sometimes because they're for the people. You know, I mean, so, yeah. What does it look to like to do that in relation to, to systemic you this work? Have you, do you know of places and communities where, where you can say, you know, this works? I've seen, I've seen yeah. places where, yes, um, and even in some surprising communities where mm -hmm. you would not think that some of this would take root. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think there, there are possibilities. And again, some, some people coming, coming out of those communities have written sort of testimonies mm -hmm. about that, about how that journey happened for them. And I think those can be good resources uh, to take up in a polarized situation. One of our, our participants has asked an interesting question. Um, it may be red herring, it might not be, um, but they ask, is choosing whiteness an immoral choice? Is it an immoral choice? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd be curious to know more about, about that question. Yeah. Right? I mean, I think, I don't know if this is getting at um, questions about, um, you know, race as a construct, you know, mm -hmm. or if this is mm -hmm. maybe thinking about, you know, how, what are sort of the ethics of communication and, and what, our, what our ethical responsibility is, mm -hmm. either to name this, because this is what truth telling looks like, or to find another, you know, whether finding another way to name it is an important dimension of truth telling. I mean, I, I don't know, I, I'd be, I think it's, I do think it is a really interesting question. 
It occurs to me that absolutely, I mean, digging deeper into it would be, um, I think, a really important thing to do. But at the end of the day, what we're talking about is communities um, that are ostensibly formed around an understanding of, of you know, in some traditions called perfection or holiness, this mm -hmm. idea of us together. And our, our big hope is that we will be transformed along the way into something that is better than where we are right now. Mm. So the community is going to be full at the get-go of people who have made immoral choices along the way. Um, For sinners, I mean. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. And in, indeed, we, we were talking about this in our prep conversation, you know, thinking about Jesus' own crew of disciples, you've got in the same group a zealot and a tax collector. Right. That's some right. Pretty edgy stuff right there. Right. And mm -hmm. you know what, I mean, and we've talked about I mean, the tax collector is a really interesting one to contemplate, right? Yeah. Because this, where we see, you know, and we don't get like a big, we get the one tax collector arc, right, with Zacchaeus. We see him make a big vow, but we don't, we don't know what happened. They all, we don't know how their stories end, right? We just know that Jesus is always having dinner with them, mm -hmm. right? Not giving up on, on having that conversation. And so, Yeah. It is um, if somebody has chosen whiteness, um, you know, in 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 the ways we suspect the question is being asked, um, that that in itself may be an immoral choice. The question I, I I think would be whether the the church community continues to encourage the choosing of whiteness as a superior place to be, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. rather than choosing a way of being that that honors the full dignity of of all people. Right. And I think, I think it's an important question to ask, do we need that language or, or some, or some language like that, mm -hmm. that, that helps people to see what is invisible. And I think that's, you know, that's some of the things that anti-racist work has done so well is to make the visible, the invisible visible, right? Mm -hmm. For many. And so, and there may be other, I mean, you know, the metaphor of the backpack, I mean, there may be Mm -hmm. There may be other metaphors that, that can help accomplish um, making that invisible more visible. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think there may be uh, times and places along the way where if you, can, if you can make some steps, you can make some more steps and there can be, you know, there can be a wider range of possible <laughs> conversations you can have. Um, that's my hope anyway. So how does this not um, fall into the category of the progressive gradualism that King was so yeah. patient with? Yeah. Um, you know, it, it feels like what we're trying to do here is make an argument for the very thing that King was pulling his hair out about in Letter from a Birmingham Jail. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In jail. Yeah, well, I mean, I think If I think about what would it mean in a context, in a context where you, an avoidant, politically diverse situation, mm -hmm. I mean, I can just say, here's how it is. And some people will see it and some people won't. Yeah. And then I can wipe the dust off my shoes mm -hmm. and go on to the next town. Mm -hmm. And I think there may be times for that. Um, mm -hmm. But I think again about those meals with the tax collectors. Mm -hmm. Are there times when rather than end the conversation, God's spirit leads us to stay there and struggle? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I think these are important questions. Yeah, you know, the uh, so questions are coming up about the the function and character of, of dialogue. And, um, this is probably the most robust set of questions that we've got in our conversations. Yeah, go Angela. Um, so, you know, one person's asking, do we believe that dialogue, which allows, pe allows people to exude empathy and say their truth, is the best approach? Are we talking about beginning with storytelling. Um, what about talking about the hard truths that are part of the church's legacy? As one of our listeners um, points out, 
even lynching is a part of the church's legacy. Yeah. So I think what I, what I hear you trying to talk about is not compromising the hard parts of the institutional churches right. and how it's violated the terms and conditions required of the gospel, but um, somehow finding a way of creating spaces where people can encounter that truth and not just shut down. So how does dialogue play in that? Well, I actually think, you know, looking at a particular incident, perhaps something slightly more distant in time mm -hmm. of, you know, a, a racist act, a racist policy can mm -hmm. be a place where you could begin you know, because there's that little bit of distance where you might be able to keep somebody in that conversation, mm -hmm. right? I mean, um, yeah, I mean, Helen, could you just say the beginning of that, of that question or comment again? So somebody was saying um, that they're concerned about the fact that lynching is part of the church's story. And we can say, yeah, we're all sure. sorry. Yeah. Um, but how do we not, I'm going to use the phrase intentionally, whitewash mm -hmm, mm -hmm. deeply painful and often evil nature of some of that institutional sinfulness. Right. On right. the truth, but in a way that also stays connected to people um, in the ways that you're talking about. That's that's a really hard thing. So, the, you know, the, the prophets, as you mentioned, do name the hard truths because they are against the people sometimes because they are for the people. So I think folks are trying to tease out what that space looks like. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a messy space, right? And I don't think it means that you are not going to name not just this history, but the ongoing nature of this. Yeah. You know, um, I think it's how are you going to name it? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it, it, there's not a formula, I don't think, that's going to guarantee that you're both going to be able to keep everybody in the conversation and you're going to be able to name it. But I think there may be, in a particular context, and the person who can do this best is the person who is in that context and knows those people, mm -hmm. where I can think about what would be the way that is going to be, that is least likely to trigger yeah. and prime political identity and most likely to get someone into that conversation that can end up being transformative, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes engagement with history, sometimes engagement, I mean, my fear about using directly in that situation, you know, statistics, mm -hmm. is that I know what the research says about when political identity is primed, the way people respond to yep. statistics. I mean, we're all, we, and it's, it's true in the right and the left, right? Yeah. Once that identity is primed, we can read something that gives us all the statistics about a view we don't believe, and we won't. We don't believe it. Right. The statistics don't matter. So I mean, trying to figure out, and I, I do think the story, the narrative, um, and and of course preachers can do this in the stories they tell, mm -hmm. in the true stories about that they tell about the past and the present, in in ways that can be more effective than, you know, me directly railing against systemic racism in my, yeah. in my sermon, you know, I mean, I, which, which is exhausting and can feel shaming too. Um, as one of our, our participants has said, maybe asking people about their concerns and worries, which I think relates to the first point you made about relationship building with trust yeah. and curiosity, um, is a way of leaning into these conversations mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that can, um, can tell the thing that triggers the fear, I see you. And, and we're going to make a space and we're going to talk about what scares you and what, what you're worried about. Yeah. Be together and I'm going to, I'm going to hang in there with you. Right. And I think, you know, I mean, part of my wider uh, research project right now has to do with the practice of deliberation. Right. That mm -hmm. as an important Christian practice that it always has been a part of. We, something that we inherited from Judaism. It's part of our, it's part of our, um, yeah. been part of, what Christians have done, being more intentional about exactly what you're describing. Can we covenant together to stay in a hard conversation together? Yes. Knowing 
that it's not going to break the relationship. Um, because again, in, in churches that are politically divided, that is what they're afraid of. And they're yeah. right to be afraid, right? Because they saw what happened in the church down the street. They saw yeah. what happened in denominations where we came to impasses about a social or political issue and yeah. people separated. And, you know, mm -hmm. this is yep. church history. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. I mean, they're right to be afraid that that could happen in the, in the sense that it might. You know, I mean, um, I think it's, it's worth the risk, but I want to take the risk being creative about what might give me the best shot of, mm -hmm. of keeping people in that conversation in a way that's transformative in the community. One of our, one of our participants points out um, the value of uh, the sacraments and liturgy, perhaps, mm -hmm. as providing connective tissue. Um, they ask, so how could the Eucharist become our living place of confession, not just once, but over and over again? Because Jesus says, do this in, mem in remembrance of me. It's the crucifixion. So talking about and remembering who is crucified today and, and gathering mm -hmm. in all of our diversity. Um, I'm remembering the, the lectures that Jamie Smith gave on the yes. but the fraught nature of practices. Um, right. And, and there's a response to that, you know, the, 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 I can't think of her name right now, but you know, the damage of Christ, the damages of Christian. Lauren Winner. Yeah. Winner, the right. danger of Christian practices. That, Read, I think. practice, uh, you know, that's a, that's a gift from God. Mm -hmm. and we can we can drop in and see all the ways that when we get our hands on that gift, we can do things to it that are malformative. That, but but I do think yes, of course. I mean, all of this occurs in a in a life together or virtually, as the case may be. Yeah, we engage in these practice practices in ways that hopefully are. We can help people interpret them in ways that are that are more life-giving, that resist, um, you know, white supremacy and ways that don't. I mean, I, I think that's part of our task as well. At the end of the book, Lauren Winner says, um, and, and Lori has put the, the name of, and type, um, title of the book in, in the chat pod. She says, they are gifts that we have corrupted and malformed throughout the centuries, but they're still gifts from God. Yeah. And they still have sacramental power. And I think um, that's a useful thing to remember as mm -hmm. pulling our hair out and wringing our hands over how to do this right. Um, and, right. and I mean, God has something to do with this. Right? Oh, yeah, I forgot. Thanks. <laughs> fix this, okay, without God's help, okay? Um, yeah. You know, uh, right. We're, yeah. we're very fragile in our, yeah. in our spirits. Yeah. Any final words you want to give people as charge and benediction as we as we leave this conversation, which has been wonderful, and I'm I'm so glad we had you on. Oh, thanks. thanks for asking me. Yeah, I mean, I would say don't give up. Yeah. Don't give up. You know. Be curious. Be in relation. Find out who people are, and don't and and get in there, and yep. and yep. even if you it blows up. Stay in there, you know, love goes a long way. Um, I don't, I don't, there's not an answer. It's say your prayers, you know. Yeah. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, next week, we're going to be joined by our World Mission Initiative Director, uh, Dr. Hunter Farrell, who's going to explore with us the deeply colonizing and often racist underpinnings of so many of our approaches to mission in the church. So it'll be a nice companion to our, our conversation today. And he'll also be talking about the wonderful and creative um, conference that will actually be a whole month of mission for churches to sign up to, as well as the book that he and um, our assistant director, Bala Killip, have coming out called Three Stones Make Home on um, helping churches decolonize their approaches to mission. Again, Angela, thanks so much for being with us today. So glad to have you. And thanks to all of our participants too for contributing to a great conversation in the chat and Q&A pods. Thanks a lot. We'll see you guys later. Bye.